Minister Malcolm, you have suggested that there are all kinds of movements in Harlem growing that you and I don't know about? Oh, yes. Uh, frustration itself has been, has been sufficient. All that was necessary to make Negroes realize the, the importance of banding together. And Negroes are banding together. Banding together in what kind of movements? Uh, different kinds of movements, all kinds of movements. And, and they remain almost invisible. They remain almost unknown. But yet they are there. When I say invisible, I mean invisible in the sense that their existence is unknown. And no matter how much you try and track them down, you can't find them. And never try and find them through the Negro leaders. The Negro leaders are famous as apologists. If you recall, one of the most famous Negro leaders in 1959 was asked by you. Uh, about the black Muslim movement. And he said he knew nothing about it. And the next moment, you flashed a picture on the screen with him shaking hands with me, So, uh, if you will recall. So this is, what, this is their policy. This is their attitude or their reaction. They never know what's going on in the Negro community. And what form will the activities of these various so-called invisible movements take in well, home this summer? An example. Uh, Commissioner Murphy. Almost every statement that Commissioner Murphy makes uh, would give you the impression that he's encouraging the police, rank-and-file policemen, that, uh, to take whatever method or measure is necessary to hold the Negroes in check. Uh, he feeds the type of statistics to the white public to make them think that Harlem is a complete criminal area, that everyone is prone toward violence. This gives the police the uh, impression that they can then go and brutalize the Negroes or suppress the Negroes or even frighten the Negroes. Whenever something happens, 20 police cars converge on one area. This doesn't frighten Negroes. So it means that someone is either misinforming Commissioner Murphy and making him use tactics this year that he would not use four years ago or that the former policeman Kennedy would not use. And, and this uh, force that is so visible in the Harlem community creates a spirit of resentment in every Negro. They think they're living in a police state and they become hostile toward the policeman. They think that the policeman is there to be against them rather than to protect them. And these thoughts, these frustrations, these uh, apprehensions automatically are sufficient to make, this, uh, make these Negroes begin to form means and ways to protect themselves in case the police themselves get too far out of line. You have called for self-defense units, rifle clubs, oh, yes. ready to execute on the spot those who threaten Negroes. I don't think that I said that. Yes, you did. No, I don't think I said that. All right. I have called for rifle clubs that I think Negroes should, uh, in areas where the police, whether it be federal, state, or city, have proven their inability or their unwillingness to defend Negroes, the lives and the property of Negroes, then it's only intelligent and it's only right that Negroes protect themselves, and I have encouraged them to buy a rifle and a shotgun, which according to the Constitution is legal. For what? Not, not, not buy a pistol or, not, or something like that, but a rifle or a shotgun, which is constitutionally le legal. For what purpose? So that at any time, anyone makes any effort whatsoever to brutalize them or attack them or endanger them, they should have something to defend themselves. And in a country that spends, I think, $50 billion a year for defense alone, I'm shocked that uh, any, uh, there's apprehension over Negroes trying to do something to defend themselves. Well, who will determine when the Negro is endangered? I think that if the government is concerned, instead of uh, being so worried about what the Negro is going to do, the government should stop dragging its feet and take the initiative necessary to eliminate the injustices that frustrate Negroes and drive them into a method of uh, a defense such as this. You've said, Minister Malcolm, you have to expect the Negroes to rise up sooner or later. Oh, yes. What does that mean? Well, just the same thing that it meant in uh, South Vietnam and these other places where you find oppressed people. Uh, sooner or later, they rise up against the oppressor. When the Jews were being uh, uh, brutalized in Poland, there came a time when they couldn't take it anymore, and they fought back. They didn't have too much to fight with, but they fought back. Uh, and I think every oppressed people, no matter how meek and humble they are, after you drive them so far, they're going to strike back. Well, does that mean that you expect to organize battalions or uh, paramilitary units in various Negro ghettos around the country and establish th this coming summer for violent action? No, but I think that most Afro-Americans, so-called Negroes, have reached the point of no return and are taking it upon themselves to be prepared 
if the necessity ever arrives where they will have to do something to defend themselves. Well, there was talk a month ago, you remember, of a group in Harlem called the Blood Brothers who left the black Muslims when you did and then later parted company with you, we are told, because the tactics that you espoused were too mild. What do you know of them, the Blood Brothers? Well, I certainly wouldn't apologize for them. I think that uh, the approach, if, uh, if such a group as Blood Brothers exists, does it? I say, if, well, I think all Negroes are blood brothers. Every Negro I know is my blood brother. Oh, but Minister Malcolm, we're talking about a group said to number up to 400, probably more, who confess themselves to be anti-white as you are. They disbelieve in non-violence as you do. One group among them is said to believe in violence, even in murder, almost for violence sake. Another group among them are said to believe in violence only for retribution, to strike back. Well, if such a group as the Blood Brothers exists, it doesn't shock me. I would only be shocked at white people being shocked because the conditions that prevail, uh, Mike Wallace, are such that it's a miracle that such group hasn't formed a long time ago. But do they exist to your knowledge? I think every Negro in Harlem is a blood brother, whether he admits it or not. Where you find dissatisfied Negroes, that's Harlem. And where, if, whereas 20 years ago, when you'd have a little race riot, it was confined to a community. Today, Mike, if you have any kind of racial explosion, it will engulf the entire city, and it will have a chain reaction effect of spreading from city to city, and on an international scale from country to country. And I, for one, would not like to see it happen, but I am a realist enough, and I'm man enough, to face the fact that the uh, potential ingredients for this explosion exist and I will never try and make the public think that it doesn't exist. Well, when you walk through the streets of Harlem, you hear this comment and that comment, and you get the impression that everybody is ready. They have arms? I think Harlem has always been armed. Do you look for violence in yes, Harlem this I summer? Yes, I do look for violence. When you say Harlem, mind you, Harlem is New York City. Queens is Harlem. Uh, Brooklyn is Harlem. The Bronx is Harlem. Westchester is Harlem. I mean... Could you not become the leader of this kind of a group? Which kind of a group? A violent group. Well, it's not a case of becoming the leader of a violent group. Uh, I don't think any group, even that's ready, wants violence. It's a case of... Is, is this not, Minister Malcolm, a, uh, a call to action of sorts that you are raising here and now? I don't have to raise a call to action. And this is what I'm trying to make white people see. They, they have lost their ability to be objective where the race problem is concerned, primarily because they know that no real meaningful results have come from the Negro struggle. And in defense of this, they always call it or label it violence. You really believe that any meaningful result is going to come from violence? It's not a case of violence. I think that, uh, uh, it's, 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 see, if you could get away from looking at it as violence, then you would be objective and see that actually, actually all it is is a tendency to react to what they are confronting. White people don't realize how frustrated Negroes have become. I think they have become to un that they have come to understand the Negroes' frustration, but they are also of a, the opinion that no good can possibly come from violence. If they are of that opinion, Mike, if you think that uh, the powder keg that's in your house is going to explode under certain conditions, either you have to remove the powder keg or remove the conditions. You can't stand there and, and label the powder keg as, as an enemy when you have the ability or have it within your power to change the condition and it won't explode. Do you know of any contingency plan for action? No. I know, I know of none. But I don't think if you go and study the history of uh, oppressed people, usually their initial action is not a plan. Usually it's a reaction and it's on the part of a few and then everybody gets right on in with it. And I think you'll find that if, if uh, Negroes ever have to resort to any kind of physical action to defend themselves, many white people will be on the side of Negroes. Many white people are fed up with, the, with what the Negroes suffer. And this is what I had to become aware of on my pilgrimage to Mecca. I could see then that there are many white people in this country who will side with the Negro in whatever he has to do to protect himself. You have changed your attitude about the white man in the United States to some extent. Well, I've broadened my scope. Travel broadens your scope. Uh, it gives you a wider understanding. And I have, in my many lectures on college campuses, seen many whites, even as a black Muslim, 
whose uh, reaction to much of what I had to say showed me that they were genuinely concerned. Some weren't genuinely, genuinely concerned, but many of them were. And this element is increasing. But that's a considerable change of opinion in Malcolm X. No, today I'm speaking for myself. Formerly, I spoke for Elijah Muhammad. And everything I said was, Elijah Muhammad teaches us thus and so. I'm speaking now from what I think, from what I have seen, from what I have analyzed and, and the conclusions that I have reached. And the white man is no longer the devil and he is no longer bound to be evil. The Holy Quran teaches us to uh, judge a man by his conscious behavior, by his intention. And my uh, reason for going to Mecca was to get a better understanding of the religion of Islam and what the Quran teaches. So I judge a man by his conscious behavior. I am not a racist. I don't subscribe to any of the tenets of racism. Then there are good whites and good blacks and bad whites and blacks. It's not a case of being good and bad, good or bad, blacks and whites. It's a case of being good or bad human beings.